Good morning. So we have a few announcements. Uh, first is, uh, keep in mind, we have a shoebox packing party on November the 6th. And next week, we'll have um, the, the, the shoeboxes uh, that you can pick up. And so just keep that in mind. Also, it's been asked that um, uh, while other things, of course, are put in the shoebox as well, in particular need is toothbrush and scissors. And so just please keep that in mind. And again, you can pick up the shoeboxes next week to pack them. Also, if you notice in your bulletin, we have a, a, a really exciting things coming up for, um, for December, uh, for Christmas. Um, on December 11th, a light luncheon of pizza and subs will be held following by Christmas caroling. And so just very excited about that. Also, I'm looking to have a children's Christmas party on December the 10th. And if you can help out with that, that would be marvelous. And so you can please uh, feel free to see me afterwards. So just a lot of neat things going on in the life of our church. With that in mind, let's bow our hearts and our minds. Let's pray. And then, Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, what you're doing in the life of our church and our church body and, and how we are uh, really just attempting to reach our community with, with the gospel, with your word. And we pray for these upcoming things that we have going on in our church and uh, that we would lay them at your feet. And we bring our tithes and offerings to you, and we ask you, Lord, that you use our tithes and our offerings and our very lives to further your kingdom and bring glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able to, please stand for opening scripture, which is from Psalm 97. 97 verses 9 through 12. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth, you are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Let's worship the Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. 
Well, good morning. Uh, something that I failed to mention their announcements is the fall festival coming up, and it is uh, you have several sign-up sheets, one in the foyer area, one in the back or the front of the church, whatever you, the, the, that entrance. And so, uh, just a few of those um, that feel free to sign up. Again, very exciting thing that we have to do in our community. And so, uh, this morning, though, for our time of missions, and we'll also have uh, a missions moment next week as well. Um, but I just wanted to take some time out uh, to share with you what's happening in, as far as global missions within the EPC. I have Susan sent a, a link out to you this week 
about uh, this and you can go online and, and you can donate to some of these projects. Um, but it's really exciting to, to see um, what is going on in the life of our denomination, how we're reaching uh, people and um, particularly Muslims. So just let me, sh I wanted to share with you a few things. Um, uh, one project we have is Engage 2025. It's for each EPC Presbyterian to engage the Muslim people group that currently has no churches and send a team of disciple makers to them by year 2025. Also, uh, we have a global, outwork, global worker out recruitment, and so this covers promotion, travel, and other expenses needed to connect world outreach mobilization team staff with individuals in EPC, EPC churches. We have a medical ministries, uh, in which it's used to promote and resource medical ministries from our churches and presbyteries to assist the ministry of the EPC Global Workers and Partner Agencies. I've often seen uh, medical missionaries go overseas and have a huge impact, uh, and they're much more open uh, to the gospel. Uh, just take a look at what we do through the Congo as a church and about how that ministry uh, affects uh, the Congo and how people will hear the gospel through that. And so it's just something that, another thing that we do as a denomination. There's also a worldwide short-term scholarships for people of color uh, that you could donate to. There's also um, Muslim ministries in which Muslim refugees, immigrants, international students, some representing unreached people groups that are engaged 2020 initiatives are focused on. And these are now our neighbors that are coming here to the United States. And that aspect is, is, is to reach them where they are at. Also, you can give to uh, Uzbekistan. It's a, um, it comes from the Eric Presbyterian Development uh, in, Kakis, in, in Kazakhstan. And so um, that is real need that I've heard about. Also, Malaysia, uh, I'm sorry, Malay discipling making and uh, Afghan Christian materials in which materials are printed up and giving out to um, and other media needs, including electronic distribution, the good news, as well as Syrian refugee relief uh, that our denomination is part of, that you can donate to and become a part of, as also um, uh, IDEN strategic partnerships in which the International Theological Education Network trains leaders globally to help them train and send their own missionaries to unreached people groups, especially among Muslims. Um, and two more, uh, the Lebanon uh, Flyman Projects Growth Center. It's a growth center that provides the very best Christian-led early childhood development for at-risk economically disadvantaged Lebanese, Syrian refugees, and migrant children. And the last one is one that our Presbyterian involved in and one that we give to as, uh, as a church. That's Edgy Nations uh, in the country of Sierra Leone. And again, it was started by our Presbytery, um, but it's something that the EPC itself has, has taken a part of. And it's, it's to poverty-stricken West African nation. And it has launched schools, which has birthed churches, which have planted more churches. And so these funds will be able to support the ministry of the schools as well as assist national church planners. So again, uh, just a lot of cool things that our denomination is doing. The EPC, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, as it reaches out to the world. And if you notice, and this is the thing that I, I, I've noticed when I went to, um, to General Assembly. When you walk the halls and you overhear conversations, it's so much about Muslims and reaching Muslim peoples and it's very touching to see uh, how our denomination is really seeking to reach the world, but especially Muslim countries. And so, again, Susan will send out this link to, to the church so that you can, if you so feel led, you can donate to some of these projects because it really is amazing to see what our denomination is doing and reaching unchurched people and uh, those who are not Christians, and especially Muslims. So. Um, with that in mind, let's bow our hearts and minds in prayer as we pray that, that for these things. Heavenly Father, we just lift up um, the, um, these, these projects that are ongoing, that our, our denomination is part of, and just pray that your, your watch care uh, be on each of these projects, that as a denomination and those outside of the denomination can, can take part in this, uh, can give money, but not only money, but time and especially prayer and so we lift these things up to you and ask you that you use these these 
the, the times, um, they use the money here, uh, you use the efforts uh, to reach people in your name that uh, people might come to know you and might have a safe relationship to, with you, especially those in the unreached peoples and Muslim countries. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, well, if the children would come forth for the children's message, um, and uh, I, as we um, go over the New City Catechism questions, and this is question number 42, and I will read the question, and we can respond all together with the answer. The question is, how is the word of God to be read and heard? With diligence, preparation, and prayer, so that we may accept it with faith, store it in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. Okay, so I have something for you guys that I want you to see that's truly, truly, it's a bag, but what's in the bag, though, it's disgusting. Pizza. <laughs> pizza. Pizza's disgusting? <laughs> it's not pizza. It is gross. It is something that Lydia had, and she really messed up. Really, really awful. And it, <laughs> no, no, but it's something that <laughs> it is something that she has, that she had, and it's really it smells. <laughs> oh gosh! Oh. She really messed it up. Shh, listen, sit down. She messed it up really, really awful. I and mean, it's, it's like dirty and nasty and smelly. A stinky diaper. A stinky diaper. It's kind of close, right? But she did it on, it's like really, really nasty. Did you, did you see? <laughs> Is that dirty or nasty? It's a blanket. It's a blanket, but it's not dirty or nasty at all, is it? Now, I was joking. Now, here's the thing. Um, just as you did, as all babies do, they mess up some clothes and so forth. Um, actually, I'm not sure if she messed this one up or not, but this is really, really clean now, right? It's very, very clean. You can. It's comfy, too, right? Isn't that nice? So... Um, you know, it's very nice and comfortable, and it's all clean. Um, and, you know, there's things that, that clothes, there are clothes that you guys have messed up. You've been in the mud or something like that, and it's been, like, all dirty and gross stained. and stained and smelly or whatever. Um, but your mom puts it in the washing machine and maybe uses some, uh, some type of cleaner on it, some stain remover. Uh, and cleans it up, and it's all clean. And it's really neat when that when that because you you there's sometimes that things that get so dirty, clothes that get so dirty, and you're like, okay, this is never going to come out. This is never going to work. This is always going to be dirty. This is always going to be smelly. Sometimes it happens. But what's really neat is though is when a clothes and you you wash it good and it's clean. Yes. It's not coming off. Yeah, and there's like, you know, things that, that you or your brothers do or something like that, and it makes it close really gross. And sometimes they don't come off, but what's really amazing is when they do come off or when they are clean. The thing about it is, it was when you think about our lives, um, we are, have, do, we have what's called sin in our lives. And it's, it's yeah. It's really, is sin nice? No, not at all. It's ugly, and it's terrible, and it's Can awful. Shh, listen, listen, it's uh -huh. awful, and ugly, and terrible, and nasty, and dirty. But you know what? Garbage. It's garbage, but... It's yeah, you know, but the thing about it is, is what God does through his son, Jesus Christ, is he applies what he did on the cross for us and 
the, there's a psalm called Psalm 51 in which David did a really, really horrible things and he, some awful things. And he said, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. How, 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 how white is snow? Yeah, like it's, powder. it's it's powder. It's clean. It's it's white as could be. Yeah, and that the baptism looks looks forward to what Jesus did on the cross for us, so that we can be forgiven, right? And and so that's the thing that that we always have to remember is that we can be like ugly, nerdy, d- 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 ugly, dirty, nasty. Um, through our sin, and we are, I am, everybody is. But through Jesus Christ, we can be clean, and we can be whiter than snow. And just like, I'm not sure if this is actually messed up, but this is so clean right here, right? I mean, it's so, I, I kind of fooled you guys. But it's not, it's not dirty at all, right? It's very, very clean. In the same way, Jesus, when he cleans us, through what his son did for us on the cross, we are clean and we are as white as snow. And so just remember that, okay? And we'll talk about this morning about evil and good. And within every single one of us, myself included, there is this thing called evil. There's this thing called sin. But, but God has, has, has washed me through what his son did for me as just as he would do for you guys as well. So I'm going to pray for you guys, all right? Heavenly Father, just lift up these little children to you and pray that they understand that through your son um, that their sins might be forgiven. Pray that they come to know and understand the, the ugliness of, of their sin, uh, just as we all have ugly sin in our lives. But that through your son and only through your son may our sins be forgiven and we will be washed, wiped completely clean, and so that uh, we will be whiter than snow. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel, and pray for each of these children that they come to know and understand it. In Christ's name, name we pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you, guys. Go back and sit down now. So this morning, uh, we have a few prayer requests, um, and that is uh, we are praying for uh, Landon, a troubled teen. And so just lift him and his family up in your prayers. Also, please pray, uh, continue praying for for David Hahn. Uh, Pray that his legs get stronger and back to where they were before surgery. And also, of course, pray for for June as well and their whole whole family. So uh, just lift them up in prayer. Also, uh, we have other prayer requests that we've been praying for, uh, including the fall festival coming up and pray that that will go well. Uh, as we reach out to to our community, and uh, there are the prayer requests that we'll be praying um, those that are spoken and non spoken so um, before we do that though, I want to read uh, from scripture this morning from first uh, thessalonians let's see hold on I have it marked um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, verses 19 through 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22. Hear now the word of God. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, lift up these prayer concerns to you, including Landon and David uh, pray your watch care over them, but other prayer concerns as well that we have been praying for, uh, including Kay and the rest of her family, as they uh, just mourn the, the the loss of of Ron, and and so just pray uh, your watch care over them. We continue to lift up Joe and Bev and Don in our prayers, and just your healing hand be upon them all. We lift up uh, the fall festival to you, though, as well, Lord, and pray that uh, this will go well and, and just lift these things up to you. 
Uh, Lord, there's so many things in our prayer request that, that are spoken, those that are not spoken as well. And we lift all these things up to you. Know, you know our hearts, you know our struggles, our cares, our worries, and you know the problems that we face. We think of your word this morning, and uh, we pray that we seek to follow it, that um, we, we test, we, we do as the Apostle Paul says, and, and that we, we test um, all these things that come before us, and we hold on to what is good and reject every, every single kind of evil. Uh, so that we might be Christians and as a church, your church uh, that you've called us to be, that we might be your witnesses uh, in a community that, that has so desperately lost you. And so, Lord, we, we pray that um, as, as a church family that we would do that. Um, as we see the world around us that is embracing the evil and oftentimes rejecting the good, we pray that we understand from your word what evil and good is and we seek to grasp hold of, of the good and reject the evil, every kind of evil so that we might be salt and light to the lost and dying world and we pray that as a church family that we do this and as a church family we come to you and pray in this Lord's prayer praying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debtors as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand if you are able. This is a song that I wrote many years ago and uh, I wanted to share it with you today um, it reflects on the Lord's love for us everything that he's done for us on the, cro on the cross and the suffering that he went through and just the fact that the Lord is our father and we belong to him each and every one of us are chosen to be his the song is called I Am Yours. We'll go through it the first time, and then you can join the second time. Before you lay the foundations of the earth, for you made the stars and put them in their place. For you caused the sun to shine upon the earth. You made a way for me. You thought of me in the garden when you sweat great drops of blood when you were beat beyond the visage of a man when they nailed you to the cross and raised you up you made a way for me Jesus you died for me you paid the price for all my sins. You bore my guilt and shame. My precious Lord, I glorify your name. You meet me where I am, O oh Lord. Your love for me endures. And I cry, Abba, Father, I am yours. I worship you, my Savior. I am yours. But 
before you laid the foundations of the earth, before you made the stars and put them in their place, before you caused the sun to shine in the give you thanks and praise, Lord, for meeting us where we are in our walk with you. And it's our prayer, Lord, that you remain here this morning and that you bless hearts, soften and prepare those that are in need, Lord, and that you use uh, our pastor by your word, Lord, to minister to our hearts and to bring us to where it is you want us to be in our walk with you. May you be glorified in all things, Lord, and may we be a blessing to you and to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Bill and Wendy and Sweetie. I have to tell you, I saw Alden last night. He's looking at me like, what are you, the world are you talking about? I saw Alden last night. Well, not Alden Snell, but Alden, New York. I, I, um, I traveled back um, from Buffalo, one of um, Lancaster uh, or church in APC Church, uh, the ordained um, Will McCabe, and so is an associate pastor, and it's great to see. And I passed through Alden on the way home, and so it was like, oh, okay, I got to use that joke tomorrow. So, uh, anyways, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans, Romans chapter 12. 
Romans chapter 12, and we will read the second part of verse 9. Actually, um, let's just keep in mind what came beforehand, and that is uh, love must be sincere. And then the Apostle Paul writes, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you and ask you that um, we would approach this text and understand it and seek to apply it to our lives. And uh, we truly, in our thoughts and our minds and our words and our actions, we truly do what your word tells us to do and that we hate what is evil, but we cling to what is good. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I want to share with you an illustration that I heard from Don Carson, D.A. Carson, as he's sometime called. And uh, I looked for it online, and I just, I could not find it. But, um, so I apologize if I get some of the details wrong. But um, if you know Don Carson, again, or D.A. Carson, as he's sometimes called, he's uh, an amazing Christian leader, um, and he is a... Uh, theologian and a professor and as a theologian and professor he is an, in academic circles very often times and there was a colleague of his and for some reason I want to say her, her name was Francine I'm not sure if that's right or not but that she knew and again he it's in his academic circles that he he goes around and and uh, we'll say that it's Francine because it I just hear that accent of his and it, it sounds right but Francine apparently uh, had problems acknowledging sin, acknowledging that there was evil in the world. And just an amazing, amazing uh, apologist, a devout Christian as he was, and really sought to talk to Francine about the gospel and particularly about sin and evil. And even brought out examples of Hitler and, and Paul Pot, and then saying, is this evil? Well, her explanation, well, that's just one in, in a million. That mankind is really not evil. We're not, people are not sinful. And he would go over and over, and is there evil, Francine? Is there evil? No. There's no, really no such thing as evil. It's just people who are misguided, people who have struggles in their life, and people are not truly evil. And then one of the, their acquaintances that they know got arrested for abuse, child abuse in particular. And he started in asking her, Francine, was this evil? Well, I, you know, I don't know the details and I don't know the, the background of his life. And so, no. And he would go to her over and over again. And you could see the struggle in her face that he, he said. Francine, day after, whenever he saw her, Francine, is this evil? Was this evil? I just can't bring, her, bring myself to say that that was evil. And then more and more details started coming out. Francine, is this evil? I just can't see that. It's, that I can't say that. Francine, is it evil? More and more details coming out, and you could see the struggle on her face until finally horrific details of the abuse came out. And she just, I, just, I can't stand it. This is, this is the place. evil. This is horrible. This is what you have been telling me that it's sin. And it finally broke her. She finally came to see that there is evil in this world. Now, why do people in our culture, I mean, you know as well as I do, that to stand up and to actually say, hate what is evil, and not really, there's not really such thing as evil or sin. I mean, people are good. And scripture says, hate what is evil. And so even just the very fact that you call something evil 
in our society, people don't like very much. Because if they're evil, if somebody else is evil, then that means I'm evil. If somebody else is sinful, that means that I am sinful. That means I have to examine my own life and see my own sin and see the evil with, it is within me and see my need for a savior. And that is the hardest thing, the most difficult thing for people to do is to say that there is evil. So it's really, really important whenever you, you talk to, especially a non-Christian and, and share and understand where they're coming from, that they're oftentimes not coming from a perspective of not recognizing that there's evil in the world, that there's sin in the world, especially within themselves. The other thing, though, is there's also a tendency to call evil good and good evil. Um, Just turn on the news, especially lately, and see what our culture has become. And uh, the, the biggest example in my mind is what is being done to little children. Uh, and trying to change their, their, their sex from male to female or female to male at very young age. And it's so disturbing to see. Um, and I sit back and I look at it and I'm like, that's, that's evil to do that to, to little children. Um, so I want to think about, though, the passage from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, verse 20, Isaiah 5, verse 20, and this is so important for us to grasp hold of. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so Isaiah tells us, the word of God tells us, that woe to those who call evil good and good evil, that they look at what is evil and they call it good, or they look at good and they call it evil. Now, what are we supposed to do then? How are we supposed to know what's good and how are we supposed to know what's evil so that we don't do that ourselves? Well, that's the reason why I'm looking at doing some research. I said, you know, okay, we have to look at this from a biblical, biblical perspective because there's a tendency in all of our hearts and our minds to say, okay, what I consider to be evil or good, or at least what I consider to be somewhat sinful, is people who, I don't know, who don't act like me, who are not like me. And especially when we go and we think about the church is what the sermon series is on, and and in a few weeks we'll, we'll think about Um, confronting people about their sin. Um, And even next week, we'll think about uh, looking at ourselves first and foremost and examining our own lives. We have to do this biblically. We do not need to call a, um, what is not a sin, a sin. By the same token, we do not need to let um, sin dwell within us, especially, and not call it sin. And so it's vitally important that we understand biblically uh, what the Bible calls evil, what the Bible calls sin, and then on the flip side of that, what the Bible calls good. So um, when we talk about abhor the evil, but cling to the good. So I want us to look at um, Genesis. We add, there's a handout in your, in your bulletin that you can look at. If you don't have one, you can feel free to, to raise your hand and the usher will, somebody will get one for you. Um, so anyways, uh, I just want us to go and look at it and we're going to read through this and then seek the applications. So from Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination, the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Matthew 15, 19, for out of the, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. John three nineteen. This is the verdict. Light is come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Galatians five nineteen through twenty one. The acts of the flesh are obvious, 
sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to shed and to rush into evil, false witness who bores out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Proverbs 17, 5. Whoever mocks the pure shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. And finally, Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable. How much more so when brought with evil intent. Now, so these are the things that scripture calls evil. And when Paul writes in Romans 12, this first part, uh, Romans 12, he says to us that we are called to hate what is evil. Other true translations might have abhor. And it's, it's, it's to utterly detest something. It's, it's like if you've ever come across a nasty, dirty, filthy rag or something of that sort, and it's it's disgusting. It smells awful. And you abhor it. You utterly detest it. In the same way, this is what we're called to do when we see evil throughout the world. Is that there should be, when we look at it, not only throughout the world, but in ourselves as well, that we are to do to detest these things, utterly detest these things, abhor them. Secondly, though, and this is the positive aspect to it, we're to clean what is good, to clean to what is good. And so I also have those things that are considered good in Scripture. So look with me, if you will, um, from the passages, and again, in your bulletin, uh, from Genesis 1-4, God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Genesis 1-10, God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas and he, God saw that it was good. From Genesis 1-12, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 17 and 18. God sent them and God set them in the vault of the sky to give them light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 21. So God created the creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. Now those are all of the creation days and after every creation day, after God created each one of these single things, he stepped back and he said that it was good. Um, including, sorry, Genesis 1.25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that moved along the ground according to their kinds and God saw that it was good. Then on the sixth day, then on the sixth day, mankind was created. And uh, it, we'll see in verse 31 what God says about that. The God said, let us make mankind in our, in our image and our likeness so that so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air over the livestock and all the, all, all the wild animals over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. and the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then, in Genesis 131, after that, God saw all that he had made, and it was not just good, but very good. All of creation that he made. All of creation. But then, especially, of course, the sixth day he created mankind. 
he created men, male and female. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So just to pause right there, because I think this is real important in our culture to see. Isn't it great what God's creation is and how it's good? And then as displayed before us, how what he did about creating mankind, men and women, men and women, created mankind, men and mankind in his own image, the image of God who created them, male and female, he created them. All that is very, very, very good. And we need to understand that. And that's so really important this, this day and age to understand the goodness of God's creation and the way that he created you and the way that he created me, including that he made male and female. There was an obvious sense of creation when he created mankind. He put some as men and some as women. And we should rejoice in the goodness of that. And this is what oftentimes breaks my heart. And we will get to this when we talk about outreach and evangelizing, that there should, when we see people disregarding the good, it should utterly break our heart to tears. Yes, we should understand, of course, there should be some holy anger and so forth, but more than anything, we should rejoice in God's good creation and how God created us, including the fact that he made mankind in his own image, including the fact that he created us, including the fact that he made men and women. And it's very good. And we should love and appreciate the goodness that is within us, and it should break our hearts utterly when we see people departing from this. Continue. Genesis 131. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, immortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Nahum 1, 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. Psalm 107, 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who, who takes refuge in him. Psalm 73, 28. But as for me, it is good for me to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. And finally, in this section, to think about John 10, 11. Um, the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Again, what is tragic, incredibly, incredibly sad, is when people don't acknowledge the wonderful, amazing, astounding effects that Jesus is the good shepherd. That the best thing, the goodest thing that one could ever do, I understand goodest is probably not a word, but you get it, is to look to Jesus Christ, is to look to God, is to have God in one's life and to taste and see that he's good and take refuge in him. And again, these scriptures point this out to us that the ultimate good, as we'll talk about it a little bit later, is, is to look to him. Matthew 13, 8 and 9, talk about uh, good soul. It's the parable that we know is most familiar, but let's look at it. Still, other soul fell, fell on good soul, where it was produced a crop 160 or 30 times which was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And so when we approach the word of God, we should be like 
good soul. And that we should let God's word permeate and touch our lives. We also should see the good gifts that we get from God, how God has blessed us as from himself, as from God. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Also, Proverbs 11.27, whoever seeks good finds favor, but evil comes to those who searches for it. And also, what we see, how scripture is to be used as we want long to be good soul. All scripture is God breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for what every good work. So this word of God teaches us, rebukes us, corrects us, and trains us in righteousness so that we as servants of God might do what good works. Ephesians 2.10 tells us what we were made for. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And finally, Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have every opportunity, let us us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So with those scriptures in mind, let's just take a step back and think about um, evil and good. And again, evil, the word there is to utterly detest evil. And on the flip side of that is to cling to these other passages of scripture that calls good, good. The word there for clean is the same word that's used um, for when a husband, in scripture, for when a husband and wife cling to each other. That's how much strongly that we should embrace what scripture calls good. So all this is really, really important for several things, okay? Especially, and I wanted to do this before we started thinking specifics about, okay, how do we confront sin in our lives and how do we confront sin in others? Something that we'll cover. But before we do that, we sort of need to take a step back and see, okay, what is evil and what is good? We need to have that in our minds and our hearts. Biblically speaking, what is evil and what is good? Because if we just go forth and start willy-nilly without looking at Scripture, then our approach... And the things that we judge other people about or not judge other people about are oftentimes not truly biblical. And so we need to understand from the Bible what should be our approach. What is evil and what is good? And that is what is evil in our minds and our hearts. We abhor those things. We utterly detest those things. And that is what is good we cling to. We cling to these things. So, just several applications as we think about this. Okay? The first and really most important is this. If you're sitting here this morning or listening online, all this may be completely new to you because you may not even be a Christian. You may not even understood evil and good and your need for a savior, your need for Jesus, and to look to him. And so it's really, really important that you understand that within your life, as well as in mine, I have evil. I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. Just as I shared with the little ones this morning, there are utterly nasty things within our hearts and our minds that only Jesus can heal, right? But once he does, it's like that blanket over there. It's cuddly, it's warm, it's soft. 
We're whiter than snow. Our sin has been wiped clean. Doesn't mean we're perfect. By any stretch of the imagination, it should mean that our sin is no longer held against us. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, you can look to him in saving faith. Secondly, what I just shared with you, again, I... I'm looking out here, I think most of you are believers, but one of the things that as we continue on in this is, okay, how to share my faith. This right here, this verse, is a great way to share your faith. To just do what I told you. Because not only when you preach the gospel from the pulpit, not only are you touching those that you don't know who's a Christian, but you're also touching Christians' lives so that you can go out of the world and share just what I shared. This is a great verse to say to people, there is evil in this world, but there's also good. And so ultimately speaking, what is the good? What is the best? It's Jesus Christ. Again, we see, for instance, from Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things beyond cure. Who can understand it? If it's deceitful, it's evil. And you can share the gospel with somebody. You can share with them how they too are a sinner, like yourself, but they might be wiped clean. And we're called to cling to what is good. What is the ultimate good? It's Jesus Christ. And so we're called to share our faith. But third, there's something else here that I think it's important for even us as Christians to take in mind and take to heart. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 talks about the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing, but the good I want to do, I don't do. In other words, there's a struggle. Now, look, he uses a different word for evil, okay? The word evil here in looking in the research seems to be more geared towards non-Christians. But he still uses a word that could be translated as evil, kakos. So if we utterly detest evil in every form, we should oftentimes be like the Apostle Paul. I see my life and I see the evil that I've done and I don't want to do, the words that I say, the thoughts that I think. And as we'll talk about next week, we always need to examine our lives. We see these things and we're struck by the evil that is within ourselves. And it's a struggle. When I was a youth minister, I would tell kids all the time, look, if you're not struggling with some type of sin in your life, chances are you're probably giving in. That's to be true for us where we're like the Apostle Paul, where we're continually, okay, Lord, I want to more and more be like you. I want to have in my heart and show me the things I need to work on. Be careful that prayer. It's a prayer that we should pray, but be careful for that prayer because you're going to end up like the Apostle Paul. The evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. The good that I want to do, I don't do. But then, of course, how does he end up? Who will deliver me from this body of death? It's Jesus Christ. And so, as Christians, as believers, for those of us who who really seek to apply this to our lives, who intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually abhor, detest what is evil and cling to what is good. As we see this within our own hearts and minds, we cling ultimately to Jesus. We cling to his gospel. We cling to his word. We cling to scripture. We cling to prayer. We cling, lay claim to the wonderful good things in life and cast the others aside. And Sunday school this morning, I've heard 
from one of you who you studied in it as well about idols and how idols in our lives had to be confronted. Thinking in terms of there are good things in this world, very good things in this world that in and of themselves are not evil, but what I do to them, how I put them over and above and beyond God, that's evil. Those are the things that I should detest with them on heart and mind, but I cling, I cling to what is good. I cling to Jesus Christ. So these are the things that in our Christian walk that we are called to do, that we're called to, to walk through. To utterly abhor, utterly detest that which is evil, but is clean to what is good. And that ultimately, of course, is Jesus Christ. It's my heart. That's my prayer for us all. Is that we would be ones who would walk through our lives and we see evil and we detest it. We would cling to what is good. One final thing, and that is this. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that we don't serve a harsh taskmaster, harsh taskmaster, such as Facebook or Twitter? I mean, one thing I think the world is finding out is that there's always going to be a master. Say the wrong thing on Twitter, and it changes consistently, constantly. What was wrong 15, 20 years ago is not wrong today, and vice versa. And there's no grace. There's none. You're canceled. That's it. And so we can think we're free by doing those things, by following what the world says. And we'll ultimately find it's the harshest taskmaster of them all is what the world does and what the world teaches. Loved ones, don't fall in that trap. Truly, honestly, in your heart and your mind, abhor, utterly detest the evil that is not only in the world, but it was inside of you but cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. Cling to what scripture says is good and cling ultimately to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you and ask you, Lord, that within our hearts and our minds that we would understand your truth and seek to apply it to our lives and that we would utterly detest the evilness, the, the sinfulness that is within our world and even within ourselves. But even more so, we would cling to the wonderful, the good, the gospel. We would cling to you, Jesus. For you are the author and finisher of our faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please stand if you are able.
receive now the benediction to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.